Did that break anything? <laughs> Let's see if he's here. Yeah, there he is. Hey. How's it going? Good. Well, you know, I'm going to take these off. This is not working for me anyways. Uh, I'm not even sure why I started with those. Mark, I mean, it's a good look. Thank you. I, you know, I wear headphones so much, it's almost more native for me. I, I like, I've got the hairstyle for it. The hairstyle for headphones. Um, That's how you get the studio quality audio in, in all of our video conferences. <laughs> that, this is so, people who know me know. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, there's my daughter, Adeline. Hey, Adeline. <laughs> We're busy right now, sweetheart. Not right now, sweetheart. You want to give me a hug? Okay, that's no one. Uh, I mean, you can't I, really say no to that. Come on, give me a hug. Come give me a hug. I challenge you, if you're watching this AMA, to begrudge me giving my daughter a hug when she asks so nicely like that. Come here, sweetie. I mean, girl. you can't. I mean, Ada. Ada, there she is. Yeah, there. Oh, say hi. Oh, oh wow. hey. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sweetheart. Have fun playing. She apparently was out there doing water balloons, I think, uh, her and her brother. All right, thank you. Close, close the door, please. You know, I actually have a busy light outside my door that I turn on, but apparently for a three-year-old, that is a little bit much to ask. Anyways, yeah, I do go, I geek out on all my equipment. You know, this is the mic I'm using, standalone here, powered up. Um, it's a, it's a I, kind of a habit, I suppose, when you're in the AR, VR field to, to you know, get on, your, get on your tech game. Okay, so let's talk about, well, first of all, we got questions pulling in. I haven't gotten the first question in front of me yet. So let me just do an easy one. How was your long weekend? What'd you do? And did it, and did it involve Sweet Baby Ray's? That's what the people want to um, know. I mean, unfortunately, no. I mean, Sweet Baby Ray's is, uh, it's, it's, you know, it's, you can never have too much Sweet Baby Ray's, but no, no barbecuing. Um, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm out in, um, in, in Kauai and getting some surfing in, which is awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's uh over the summer that the waves are a little smaller so you know it's the summertime <laughs> sadness but it's uh it's you know it's pretty fun it's good it's funny How about you? you will appreciate this mark so archer my six-year-old boy uh you know does not a big eater sometimes i think he's a miracle of science just how little he consumes and how fast he's I, able yeah to grow. we have that too it's just unbelievable it's a, it's a miracle uh one of the things that we had talked to some people that said try different sauces we laid out all these barbecue sauces for him to try and he on his own accord no pressure from us Sweet Baby Ray's is his number one. So he now... I mean, it's not a surprise. It's a, it's a great, you know, it's a, it's a high quality brand. And, um, you know, they make the highest quality, quality stuff. So when you're smoking meats, you know, it's, there's really only one choice. So many smoked meats. I really think that uh, it, this whole thing was a long con for you to get a sponsorship deal from Sweet Baby Ray's. This entire Facebook thing was really just the really long play. I, I mean, if, if I can help them sell some more barbecue sauce, I'm, I'm down. All right, here, we got some good questions coming in. I want to make sure we make good use of people's time. Um, oh, yeah, so things are starting to open up. People want to know where Portal is going. Uh, and we can both take a, take a shot at that. But, you, Mark, you, you really put a lot of, uh, you know, energy into Portal during the pandemic. You know, it became such a lifeline for us at the company uh, with employees working from home. Where, you know, where do you see Portal going uh, in the long term? Yeah, well, well look, I, I do think a lot of norms – got established during the pandemic that I think are going to be around for a long time, right? So people are, are more likely, I think, to, to just casually want to do video calls and, you know, with, with friends and, and do social gatherings that way um, when people can't be together. You know, before that was kind of like, all right, that's not so so fun. You know, yeah. we'll just hang out with the people who are around us, you know, it's, and, and, and this is going to be sort of annoying if, um, if that's, you know, if, if you have to do this over video. But... Um, but, you know, now I think that that's just a more normal thing and, you know, both for work and, and doing a lot more video um, and, um, you know, you know, and hanging out. I think that that's going to be a big thing. So, you know, I mean, you, you know, all this stuff. I mean, I, I try to not mess this up because I don't know, I, like I it's hard for me to keep in mind exactly which of the details of what we're working on are public and, and <laughs> yeah. not. not I'm in it. But um, but. You know, we have an exciting roadmap of of, um, of stuff that basically leans into what I think are going to be some of the new social norms um, around around video presence, and well, and that certainly it connects to the bigger picture of all the AR and VR stuff that we do, because you know, a lot of people think about VR and AR, it's like there are these technologies. Really, what they are is tools and platforms to deliver a sense of presence, and video does that too. It's it's you know it's not ideal. It's two D. Um, you know, it's when I see you on a screen, I I can kind of get a sense of what's going on with you but i sort of still need to trick my my mind into yeah. feeling like i'm there with you whereas vr and ar really just um you know make you in a very native way feel like you're there with the yeah. person um but video for a lot of people it's the best that we have for for presence today and it's we view this as all just kind of one um extension 
you know, extended product category um, in, in Facebook reality labs. Of, like, here's all the ways that you're going to feel present with people. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, like locally, just looking at Portal, you're right. Like connecting people during the pandemic was a great, uh, an important piece. Connecting people who work together is an ongoing piece that's going to be, and I think that is a part of the macro shift for us there. But it does stitch into something bigger. Uh, this is a good example right here. One-on-one -on -one communication, even over this mobile phone, uh, and I have a mini phone, is, is pretty good. But as soon as you start adding more people, you need space. Like that's what your brain, that's how your brain understands like yeah. group conversations like side conversations are impossible on vc totally reasonable in real life uh I, i'm gonna tie into this and then i'm gonna get back to the questions you got to try this week mark uh, I've, I've teased a little bit in the past some of the, that we're working on tools for people to collaborate at work and you got a chance to jump in with me this week uh on one of those tools i take meetings in vr uh every week and i tell people that uh that's something that we're working on that we're developing uh, and it gets directly to the point you're talking about. It's just so much easier. We actually had side conversations effectively in a virtual meeting, and you can't do yeah. it on VC. You can't do it without yeah. spatial audio. Yeah, but I also think, I mean, one of the things that that really clicked for me is I, I have a hard time sometimes remembering all the video conversations that I do because it, there's no sense of space, right? It's like, yeah. this is how we form memories. Is like, all right, you're to my right, and I'm to your left, and we kind of are in a space together. But, you know, now it feels like a lot of the the place that the conversations happen is, you know, over a video conference, you're in some kind of grid it is like the space that you're in and everything sort of blends together, um, which again, it's, it's, you know, better than a lot of the other tools that we have. And we help, you know, hundreds of millions of people a month have those kind of conversations right in between WhatsApp and, and Messenger. Um, you know, we're probably building the, the, the two of the biggest and leading video chat um, services in the world. Um, but I, I just think the promise is so much greater on 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 VR and, and AR and and yeah, I mean the demo and, and the work that we that we're doing um, you know over there and some of the things that we have coming not too far down the line, which I right. think is going to be really exciting, um, help you deliver the sense of, of presence. It's not just the spatial audio; it's like you're physically you feel like you're in a place, yeah. um, you know, even if you're you're not actually physically together. It's really cool. Yeah, this is one of my favorite things to tease all my, my viewers with, which is it's coming sooner than they think. Of course, they don't know how soon I think they think it's coming, but it's, that's what I always tell them. Mark, yeah, but it's tough because I think we, we think pretty long term, right? So true. it's like that's when you true. have a 10-year roadmap saying that something is coming kind of soon is, um, yeah. you know, it's, I think it might be easy to get people's hopes up. But, but no, I mean, this one, I mean, if we're, if we're doing demos in it, it, it can't be that yeah. far off. This, this one's pretty close. You're right. Um, this is what Aqua VR, who always comes and comments on and asks questions, great questions on my AMAs. Ask a question about assistive touch on iWatch. Did you see that demo that came out for Apple? They're kind of assistive touch. It's very oriented towards accessibility on mm -hmm. Apple, but it's, it's kind of a gesture-based control using existing iWatch things. Aqua VR, I can tell you right now, we can't answer. We don't. We haven't used it. We don't know what it's about. But I do want to. They yeah. do ask a question about EMG and the bands that we're talking about with control labs instead of face reality labs. You have you from a very long time back had a very strong vision uh, for neural interfaces, the ability to, to have more fluid controls. You've invested this, you know, before we worked with control labs, we had uh, research in building eight that was oriented in this direction. We still have those teams working with UCSF. Um, talk to me about how you think about the, imp why is it so important that we have these higher bandwidth neural interfaces? Well, whenever you're designing a new platform, I think one of the most important aspects of it is, is input. I, I think in a lot of ways that how you control it is um, is the most defining aspect of a platform, right? A lot of people think about AR and VR as sort of what's the output, like what do you, what do you see? Um, but I think the the bigger thing that defines, you know, PCs is you have you know keyboard and mouse. For phones, it was you have this multi-touch and and kind of swipe input. Um, so the question is, what are you going to use to control this natural interface around AR and VR? And you know, our view is that it's going to be somewhat of a combination of things, right? It's like you'll have voice assistance, but and that's gonna, gonna be neat, but um, you know, you're not always gonna wanna use voice because you know, there, there are privacy issues with that. You wanna sometimes control things without it kind of uh, telling everyone around you what you're doing. Um, you know, hands are gonna be a thing. Um, people wanna control hands, but you're not always gonna be walking around through the world with your kind of hands outstretched in front of you doing stuff. So, um, so that you know, will work sometimes better than others. Um, I think controllers are gonna be you know, one interesting dimension of this too, because you know, as good as hands can get, um, you know, if you're doing something that's really like a micro mo movement, um, you know, any gamer can tell you this, like actually having a, a, a thumb pad um, and, and that kind of tactile feedback is super important. So for things like writing, you want a stylus, it's super helpful to have something physical. But 
you know, in some ways, the, the kind of holy grail of all this is a, a neural interface, right, where you basically just think something and your, your mind kind of tells um, the, 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 the computer how you want it to, to go. Um, and, and, that, um, and, and that works. And, you know, there's a bunch of research that, that we and others are doing into this. Um, and, you know, I think the key insight that, that our team has had, you know, a lot of people, when they think about neural interfaces, they think about, like, how can we understand what you're thinking? And it's actually not about that, right? You, you, don't, you, you actually don't, you don't want to read the person's mind. You're not trying to understand what they're thinking. What you're trying to do is give the person an ability to have their brain send signals to the rest of the body about how this works. And yeah. you know, we, we have a, a system that does this, right? With, um, with motor neurons where your, your brain basically sends signals to, to your hands and, and your body, um, you know, telling them to, um, you, you know, when you want to make movements, how to control it. And, you know, it turns out that we all have some extra redundant capacity for that, right? It's, it's part yeah. of the neuroplasticity. So you can, you, you know, if, if, if uh, one pathway gets damaged, your brain can kind of get rewired, but you can train those extra pathways to control, for example, um, you know, a second set of virtual hands. Um, so that way you just kind of think and, and like down the line, you know, you're, you're basically, you have your virtual hands are typing um, and, and controlling what you're doing in VR and AR. And then, you know, you don't need to actually have a physical controller or anything like that because you, that's awesome. So I think when you get to that, we're going to have this whole kind of constellation of inputs, but, but I think that that's perhaps one of the um, more ambitious projects that, um, that, that we have going on. But I, th I think it's really promising long term, and I think the team is making good progress towards it. I enjoyed watching everyone's, <laughs> everyone's minds blown as you were going through that. The comments that were flowing by were like, what is Mark talking about? Yeah, no, I, I agree that uh, as soon as you get into neuroplasticity, I think uh, I, you, you had me. I, I, it's, been, it's been pretty staggering. It's, it's uh, truly, uh, sometimes, you know, I think we, we do feel held back by the rate at which we can communicate with these machines. They, they can do so much, but like, can I tell it what I want with enough precision, with enough specificity? Um, and, and neural interfaces do hold the promise, but of course they are a ways away. So, uh, uh, you know, virtual workrooms sooner, uh, neural interfaces later. That's the, just a rough sequencing over a 10 year arc. Um, Messier Spheroid, great name, Messier Spheroid asks, I thought you were building an operating system. Why are you, why are you building one? Uh, do you want to take that one, Mark? Um, yeah, sure. I, I mean, so first, we are building a reality operating system, right? And that's, that's sort of how we think about it, is that you know, these, these new platforms um, are so different from everything that's come before it, not just the, the input, but the type of the app model, um, you know, how you're going to discover things, how tightly they need to be optimized, right? If you're, you're building a pair of glasses that need to look like normal glasses, you, you basically are like, you, you need to have the system be so tightly optimized so you can... Um, basically do, you know, all the computation that you would expect from a modern computer, um, yeah. but do it on someone's face without, you know, like within a thermal envelope and a power envelope <laughs> yeah. um, that, that can last all day long. So, so it's, I mean, that, that's a very big challenge. So, I mean, we're, we've, the, the team is pretty far along in this, um, at, at this point. I mean, we're building a, a microkernel based um, operating system, which is you know, the architecture that you want to basically segment um, the pieces to make it as secure as possible. Um, so that way you, you have kind of as small of, of pieces um, that you know are going to be um, fundamentally trustworthy that you can build on top of. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we, we need to, to basically be able to design and customize every layer of the stack in order to build out the performance um, and efficiency that we need in order to, to deliver these, these systems. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of the, the people, I mean, Boz, um, here, here's a little known fact. Uh -oh. Um, you know, it's, um, you know, when I was, when I was getting started with, with, um, you know, with Facebook, a lot of what I studied at, at, at Harvard was, um, was, uh, systems engineering, computer systems engineering. I think it was one of the reasons why Facebook was, uh, was kind of always able to scale pretty well is because we have that deep in the DNA of the company. And, um, and Boz, um, was actually a, the, the teacher or teaching fellow for, for one of the classes that I took which is how we originally got connected. And I think he, yeah, how you got to know me and eventually chose to join the company. So True. I think between the two of us, you know, the, you know, we're not actually the ones building this thing, but, um, but it's, um, which is, which is good. But, <laughs> um, but, but I, I think the DNA in terms of kind of empathy for these kind of deep computing, like deep systems problems and how, how tightly you need to optimize things to, to be able to kind of deliver um, such a specific, 
um, you know, problem space that has never really been solved before. I, I think that this is absolutely critical. So we're, we're definitely focused on this. Um, and I think we'll have more to share um, for, for uh, developers and some folks at, at some point in the, uh, I guess that the theme of today is the not too distant future, that's but we're right. gonna leave it vague about what that actually means. Yeah, and I wanna, one of the questions that's all, this comes up, whenever this comes up, why are you building? I want everyone to know, I don't need to build everything myself. This is not, I wanna build as little as possible. And Facebook really was built on top of open source. We're big contributors to open source. We lo when, when software is available for us to use, we love using it. Uh, you know, obviously our Oculus and portal systems are, are built on uh, Android, which, which we've had great success with. Um, so I don't wanna build it. I wanna build as little as I can. What is amazing is how much you have to build to fit into these tight thermal envelopes. Uh, and I do feel at times that mine was a generation of computer programmers who were a little bit lazy. We got to be lazy. We were at the absolute, just the fattest part of Moore's law delivering tremendous gains in silicon. Um, and so you could just write kind of high level, inefficient code and who cared? We're not up against Moore's law, much tougher than that. We're up against the first law of thermodynamics. The amount of heat that we can dissipate off, your, off of your face is not very much uh, without burning you, uh, in which we you know, strongly oppose. Uh, so, so for me, like, I do think we're doing it. We, any piece of work you see me doing, uh, you see Facebook reality that I was doing, I don't want to do that work. I feel like I have to do it to deliver the vision and, uh, and, you know, building our own reality operating system, uh, is, is a, a part of that. Uh, okay. Yeah. It's not, it's not, it's also worth noting. It's not just the reality operating system. I mean, we actually have to go even deeper than that in terms of technical products, right? It's, it's, it's not just kind of making the apps efficient to the system efficient. It's, you know, it's the, the, the operating system layer and then, you know, optimizing the hardware and actually yeah. building out a bunch of our own custom silicon, right? So it's like all oh, the right. way up and down the stack. I mean, our, our hope over time, especially for things like, um, well, I guess for both augmented and virtual reality, are that eventually a bunch of the pieces of the stack can become, you know, sufficiently, you know, when this is at a big scale, each layer of the stack will be its own industry by itself. And then you'd want the whole thing to be more modular. Um, so that way, you know, we can work with other partners who are building chips and, and, um, and, and kind of support a bunch of different people who are building different hardware, different things like that. But for the initial version, in order to get this to be tightly optimized, you, you really have to go pretty deep in order to deliver something that's the experience that we want and have it last throughout the day. Yeah, the, the, the mobile workloads, um, you know, have actually that we use on our phones, we think of those as having been highly efficient performance per watt even they're an order of magnitude less efficient than what we need in terms of performance per watt for augmented reality, um, which is you know, actually pretty demanding. You know, you're, you're doing 3D graphics that have to be responsive to a real world environment. The end to end latency there is very tight. Um, so it's, it's a tremendous technical challenge. I, you know, I have said to people, and I think this is, I'm, I'm on good standing here, Michael Abrash, our chief scientist, also our chief historian, uh, keeper of the knowledge of the history of computing. Um, you know, from early on, one of the pioneers of, of computer graphics as we know them. Um, you know, he talks about this a lot. This is some of the hardest problems that we've taken on in a generation of computer scientists. And I came up in, a, in an easy period and boy, we're at the hard stuff now. I want to mix yeah. it up. The people want some fun answers. Uh, how long did it take Max to learn Civ and how long until she beats you? I don't know. I mean, it was her first game. I, I threw her in. Um, we played <laughs> on. What's up? That's not bad. Okay. What? <laughs> that, you should, that was your first game? You got a science victory out of it? Yeah, you know, it's, it, we played that game every night before bedtime for almost three months, for like half an hour, you know, so every night. And it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny teaching the kids um, a bunch of skills at the same time. She's basically learning how to use a computer and learning to play Civ at the same time, um, which I actually think Augie learning, how, I'm, I'm teaching Augie how to code. She's three, but it's, but you know, there, there are some great programs online to, to do this. And she's basically learning to type at the same time as she's, you know, learning basic coding concepts. So it's kind of one of the things that I just find really adorable is in, in Montessori, um, I guess they, it, it, when they're first learning how to read, um, so she's been learning to type, read, and some basic coding concepts at the same wow. time. It's, um, I mean, it's very basic, very basic. Um, but when, when you're teaching the kids to, to read, you, you don't refer to the letters by the letter name. You refer to them by the sound that they make. So I, I'm, I'm literally, I'm like, all right, now type a T. Oh, no, a capital T. And it's like, so I, I just think that you get into these like pretty ridiculous situations, which I think are really fun. But no, yes, I, I think, you know, a few months for, for Max to, to play her first game. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think probably 
hundreds of times of just pressing to move a unit before, rather than control pressing to move the unit right. and like being frustrated that it didn't do what you wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but, but I don't know. I, I think, you know, Civ is a game that you can play for thousands of hours. If, um, if my experiences has uh, taught me anything there. And I, I'm, I'm just glad that I can share that, that joy with her. Do people know that you're like a world-class Civ player? I mean, that's like, is that a known thing? Do people know that? Did I blow you up just now? You did. Um, yeah, no, I, I, well, I try to, yeah, well, it's, I, <laughs> well, it's, it's been nice working for you, Mark. It was a great career. I appreciate that. No, no. Oh, well, it's like, look, at I some point, I'll have, to, I'll have to live stream a, um, a, 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 a game of myself, um, you know, playing it on, on, on DD mode. But hold on. Look, while, while, while we're, we're talking about this, I have to show you something that I think is hilarious. At, um, I'm glad I'm at, at school yesterday, the, the girls put together this little booklet of, uh, I don't know, can you, can you read this? Can you see this? Civ okay. leaders. Civ leaders. Civ, Civ leaders, where they, they basically um, drew pictures. Here's Queen, Queen Guitarja. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and any, I can just go through this, but it's just all their favorite leaders from Civ. So this is good. Awesome. Like, there's like weeks of educational material in this uh, to, to cover. All right, I'm going to pick it up. I'm going to pick Civ up, I'm telling you. Um, okay, let's talk about another one. Oh, actually, this, just because this it's fun. Actually, you are a big time gamer, aren't you? Uh, 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 give, me, give me the number one game that you're enjoying in VR right now. You're a big time gamer, VR gamer. You're in there every week. Yeah. Um, I mean, getting through the pandemic, I mean, playing multiplayer VR games was like one of my favorite things. And, um, you know, in the beginning, you know, one of my favorite games was Arizona Sunshine. It was one of the first ones with multiplayer. But then more games came out over the course of the pandemic, which was awesome. Um, and I've talked a lot about Onward. Um, that, I think, is, is an awesome game. Um, the, the designers of it are really, really talented. I think they did a great job with it. And then there's a whole interesting community of folks who are designing custom boards, which I, which I really enjoy and, and, um, and, and like playing those. Um, Beat Saber just added multiplayer recently, so that's been a lot of fun. Um, I just posted a video of me, me doing, doing Beat Saber, which was, um, which yeah, is pretty was awesome. fun. Um, I, I still have a little where to go, to go on that. I, I can, I can, you know, beat a lot of the levels on expert, but I'm not expert plus yet. Um, the new, the new mixtape that came out last week, um, the Interscope yeah, mixtape, the, the new music pack, um, good stuff. Uh, so the, there were, uh, I think there's like seven or eight good songs in there that, that, that have been pretty fun to play, but. I don't know. I'm probably I'm onward. I think is probably my main my main thing. By there hours. was something there was something really elegant about starting the pandemic playing Arizona Sunshine, just a, a good old fashioned like zombie apocalypse. Shooter. Yeah, I mean, good old fashioned zombie apocalypse. Yeah, it's like you're just there with your friends killing zombies. And I hype this whenever I get a chance. But if you don't follow John Carmack on Twitter, you should. He posts um, uh, room codes uh, every week to play multiplayer Beat Saber against him. He is not easy to beat. I have not. Yeah. Made that. No, I I'm not. I'm not there yet. I've managed to beat him in a couple levels of uh, Pistol Whip, which has kind of been my go-to uh, lately. Um, I like back, that game too. Yeah, trying to get trying to get fit, trying to get those quads going. Um, but uh, man, I cannot take him on Beat Saber. Uh, okay, I got one that I'll answer from Chad. Uh, ads are running in the Oculus app. Are we going to have ads in VR too? Yeah, Chad, I think you probably are. I don't think you'll hate them as much as your question suggests that you might. One thing that people forget about uh, the, the ecosystem around applications and games is that they, they really rely on distribution. And that's not new. They've always relied on distribution. In fact, previously, part of the reason there was these big game publishers is because they could uh, have enough kind of clout with retailers to get distribution. Um, and advertising is a big part of that. Uh, you know, you don't, uh, I, this, I have long history with this. Long before I was working on Facebook Reality Labs, even when I was working on Facebook ads, mobile app install ads were powered casual gaming for an entire generation of players. And casual gaming uh, at times, is, was, I think especially at the height of the mobile boom, is bigger than any kind of gaming. I mean, you know, people just playing casual, easy, easy playing games. Um, so I do think ads are super important. You can ask, pick your favorite indie developer, pick any game you love. Go ask the developer how they feel about having the ability to promote their applications in places that give them a good return on their investment, whether it be on Facebook, Instagram, or, or in the Oculus app. So promotion is actually important. It's not just like a thing that you have to struggle through, though I respect we want those ads to be as good as possible. I don't want to sell you garbage. So if you see garbage, you can report it. Heck, you can report it to me. Um, so I think for me, like, but and then likewise in VR, like at some point when there's an economy there, 
you need to power that economy. That doesn't mean it has to be intrusive or bad. And I think we, we all have, we all know what bad ads are. We hate bad ads as much as anybody, probably more since it causes me to get more questions like this. So it's on us to make that a good experience. It's on us to make that, to live up to your expectations, Chad. But yeah, you, they, they, they are a little bit there and probably more coming. And by the way, they also drive down the cost, I should mention, of both the content as it gets a broader distribution base um, and of the hardware uh, upon which that content is built. Uh, and that's an important piece for us. We do want this to be accessible. In fact, that's my next question. Um, I saw it in here. Uh, how are you going to lower barriers to emerging technologies like augmented reality? Um, you know, Mark, one of the things that's been so important to us for all the products that we've built is that, that we get them out there and everybody can use them. And that's when you're building yeah. communication tools, you're building these utilities that give people power. That's always been so important to, to us. How can we, you know, what are, how are we thinking about augmented reality where these technologies are new, they're going to start out kind of expensive. Um, how does that play out over time? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's two big pieces here in terms of the the experience and how you get it to be accessible. One thing that I think people probably underrate is that if you're delivering a product that's about presence, you really can't have wires, right? And I think, uh, uh, so I mean, so that's that's probably not the, the most obvious place to go with this question, but, um, but I, I do think that yeah. you know, if you want this to be something that a lot of people are going to experience, it needs to be a good experience. If you're trying to deliver a sense of presence, you don't want a wire wrapped around your neck. It really like breaks the whole thing. So I, I think that that is gonna be the bar for VR and AR products of, of, of kind of high quality going forward. And I think you'll kind of see the market split into, you know, wired experiences, which are maybe gonna be less accessible to a broader number of people. And then the things that I think are gonna be the mainstream line of technology, even if it's a little harder to develop, I think getting on that wireless path is, is really important. The, the other piece, you know, that, that you were alluding to is just kind of getting the price to be as affordable as possible, right? If your mission yeah. as a company is to, um, is to serve as many people as possible, then fundamentally, you're not trying to charge a premium for your devices, That's where right. you're trying to drive the price down as much as possible, you know, including potentially, you know, even doing what consoles have historically done, which is, you know, at the beginning when they're, when they ship something, you know, they know that they're going to be selling it for a little bit, and they're going to be able to make it um, cheaper, but they, they even subsidize it a little bit up front with the hope that um, an expectation that they'll basically make that up um, on, on app sales and on other experiences um, in the rest of the economy around it. So, um, you know, that's going to be more our, our plan, right? In, in, in yeah. VR and AR, we're coming at this from the perspective of how do we um, get this in as many people as possible's hands, which is going to mean how do you make the price as low as possible for people? Um, you know, we're not looking for ways to go out of our way to you know, basically charge a premium for, for, for folks. And I, I think that that's, that um, is going to be, um, I, I think, a pretty big defining thing for how many people can use this stuff over the next five, 10 years. Yeah, it's a good point. And people forget about this. There's, a, there's also kind of a total cost of ownership story. You know, I've told this story with VR a bunch of times. You know, five years ago uh, and a few months, we launched Rift. The total cost, you know, it was a $700, $800 device. Uh, and then you've also got a machine on top of that. Oh, I think we lost Mark, but it's okay. We'll let him come back. I'm still talking. Um, and so that was a total cost of ownership of almost $2,000. Now you're talking about all in at $300. It's a game changer. Um, well, that's convenient that we've lost. Oh, he's back just in time. I'm back. You're just I can hear you the whole time. Uh, good. Okay, good. I'm glad to hear that. So we're just in time to say uh, that's it. Thank you so much. I will mention two things for the audience uh, who are out there. We built a good audience. A lot of flags. And there's a lot of, lot of flag emojis. I feel like Brazil, Brazil is winning the flag emoji war. So congratulations to all of you uh, in Brazil. Um, today at F8 Refresh, we just shared the stat that I wanted to share. The Spark AR community has surpassed 600,000 creators from 190 countries. They've published over 2 million AR effects on Facebook apps and devices. And we're tying it into Messenger so people can start playing some of these uh, live games in Messenger, which I'm excited about. The other piece I wanted to kind of call out for people uh, is that we're going to do these AMAs all the time. And if you want to sneak a few questions to Mark and have me coax him back, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep doing that. So uh, stay tuned here. Uh, follow me here. Uh, and I'll put up AMAs. And then as we build up enough interest, uh, we'll see if I can coax Mark back into it. Mark, thank you for joining me, buddy. Appreciate all right. It. Yeah, no, this is fun. All right. All right. Take it easy. Talk to you all soon. See ya.